All right, so it's, a, it's, a, it's 11 a.m. here in New Haven uh, in Connecticut. I'd like to welcome you all to Yale to this very special event, a webinar between two, two distinguished alums of the department. I'm actually sitting right in front of the Department of Economics where we have not been located for the past year during the Zoom, uh, during the Zoom era, uh, but it's a beautiful spot um, as the governor knows, uh, he's, uh, and as Todd Neat knows, he's there, he's, it's a beautiful spot. And I, I hope that I know some of you are considering coming to Yale perhaps as part of our IDE ID program. And I hope that you can experience this spot for yourselves uh, in, next year. So let me just say that what we're here for today is to celebrate um, the, the long history of the Yale IDE program, which really was the precursor, is, it, was a, it preceded the creation of the Economic Growth Center, both of which have a very long and storied history here in the department. Um, and I think because of these two institutions, the, the department over the last 50 to 60 years, really 65 years, has grown into one of the world's centers for development economics. And not only doing research, but doing policy, you know, asking the biggest questions and trying to, to change the world really and answering those policy questions. How do we, how do we develop? Um, so we have a long and storied, uh, long and storied tradition, and it's a, a central part of the, of the identity of, of the economics department. Uh, it actually goes back to, I guess, Lloyd Reynolds. I read a history that uh, Michael Boozer, who's the current uh, director of the master's program, wrote. Uh, and so I read some of that in preparing for this uh, talk. I learned some things. So the history goes back to Lloyd Reynolds, who was chair of the department before me. I'm, I'm the, current, the current chair, by the way, of the department. Uh, it goes back to uh, the 50s. Um, and then he brought in someone named Robert Triffin, who created the uh, International and Foreign Economic Administration Program, uh, which Bob Evanson then in the 60s renamed to the current uh, International Development Economics Program. So we have a, lo a long and storied history. Um, and we're, we, today we have two of our um, illustrious grads of the programs, uh, one, uh, of either, either the Yale economics program or the ID program or both. So uh, we have here Governor Patrick Jirogi. I hope I'm pronouncing that roughly correctly because I read about it on the web. So thank you very much. Uh, who has graciously uh, uh, decided to uh, agree to join us today. Uh, he received his PhD from Yale in 19, uh, 90, uh, 1993, if I'm right. And, um, has worked uh, in the International Economic Policy Committee for a long time, the IMF and elsewhere, and is now the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. And I should say that um, we have a long tradition of central bankers coming from the, from the Yale uh, economics program. Of course, there's Janet Yellen, who's now the secretary of the treasury, who has got her PhD in 71. Urjit Patel, who won the Wilbur Cross medal last year, a uh, very prestigious medal uh, that we give to our illustrious grads from Yale has received his PhD in 1990. I just learned today that the governor of the Bank of Thailand is also a Yale PhD, 1994. I won't try to pronounce his name today. I didn't practice that one. Um, so, and then uh, Tavni Suri is also here. She is not only a Yale PhD, but a graduate, one of our illustrious graduates of the master's program in, in IDE. And many of our graduates have gone on to great things in policy making. Uh, and academia, and, and Tavneet is, um, you know, one of the role models, I think, for many people. She's worked in many aspects of research uh, and, and, and policymaking as a professor at the Sloan School of Management, uh, but also uh, as a, you know, as a very active member of the, um, of JPAL, uh, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. So we're very happy to welcome her here, too. Um, so with those words, um, let me just say I'm looking forward to today's discussion on fintech, which is a very important area that Tavni has worked hard on, I know, um, uh, especially. So I, I will pass it over to you and I look forward to our, our discussion. Great, thanks, Tony, I really appreciate it. And thanks for the kind words. Um, yeah, we do have a storied history of central bankers, um, which is interesting. Uh, maybe more to come. So uh, thanks for everyone who's here and who's attending. Uh, the way we decided to run this event is just have a conversation. Uh, Gavin Joroge, it's a pleasure to have you here, Karibu Sana. 
uh, as we would say. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna have a conversation uh, with the governor and then we'll try and open up to Q&A. The way the Q&A will work for folks, please type in your questions into the Q&A in Zoom and I'll moderate and read them out as we go. And you can upvote the Q&A in the, in, the, uh, in the Q&A function of Zoom. So please use that if you have questions. Um, and I think we're off to the races. Governor, welcome again. Thank you for being here on behalf of Yale, on behalf of all of us. It's really nice to start this series of celebrating both the Growth Center and the ID program at Yale, um, you know, sort of kicking off their celebrations with this event. And we're really glad you can be here. So welcome. Thank um, you. Yeah, great. Um, so the, let me start early days and ask you a bit about kind of your career path and how you ended up at Central Bank Governor in Kenya. And maybe you can tell us a bit about that journey and, and how you got there. Thank you, Tavnit. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Tony and uh, everyone else in my alma mater um, for the invite. Um, and I'm definitely delighted to be back, uh, though virtually. And uh, thanks, Tony, for that background uh, on your Zoom uh, portal. Um, and uh, really, my journey started way back um, when uh, well, as an economist, really, when I did my uh, my undergraduate and master's in the University of Nairobi, I was quite interested in economics, um, more so that I can change the world, not so much in the sort of modern way, but uh, maybe changing the lives of people um, in particular ways. So in any event, I did that. And then, of course, uh, came to Yale, which was a very exciting time. We can talk a bit more about that. Um, and uh, after doing my PhD, I went back to Nairobi and uh, worked in the government uh, Ministry of Finance, and then eventually decided that uh, I had seen enough of the ministry and I got a job at the IMF in, uh, from 1995, where I was for 20 years. That was very exciting. I mean, really that is where I learned to become a real, I mean, I was nurtured in a sense, um, and uh, improving my skills, etc. 20 years of that. But uh, I was happy with what I was doing, and even career-wise, et cetera. And that's when this job came up, uh, being a central bank, the job of the central bank governor. I wasn't very interested in it at the beginning because you know I, I had everything sort of in front of me. But then I had this nagging problem, which is, Maybe I could make a difference at home in Kenya. Having worked with all sorts of other countries, um, maybe I could, maybe I won't, but I could never really tell. I could not tell unless I tried. So that's what I did. So I applied and uh, here we are, uh, five and a half years later, um, as the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Great, thank you. Um... Yes, we'll talk more about you being governor <laughs> in a little bit. Um, but you know, let me ask a little bit about the IMF and the transition from the IMF to being central bank governor to moving back home. Um, you know, I I spent a lot of time at home, but I haven't quite moved back home yet, like you. So, how is that transition, and you know, how has it been over the last few years? Yeah, first, the, I mean, I did enjoy my time at the IMF. It was great. Uh, I was challenged as an economist and really honed my skills as an economist. Uh, the transition from sort of classroom paradigms to sort of actual policy and discussion with uh, authorities and governments across geographies, etc. I mean, that I think was very good uh, training ground and I learned a lot. Um, and really got that sort of um, instinct of where things are, et cetera. So that was very exciting. Of course, we have very interesting people that were interested, that are still interested in development economics generally. But I think uh, policy was obviously very important. One of the things that I learned there, of course, was uh, uh, a phrase that one of the, gov well, I guess one of, somebody told me, which is no one really, no one cares what you know until they know how much you care. And that I think is something that has stayed with me all this time, you know, all these many years. 
Um, but the transition coming back home, of course, you're coming back home from, uh, let's say, an environment where everything is all clear, you know, systems work, um, you know, to a, to a system where obviously your things are not working very well. Um, but uh, so there was a bit of a transition and then realizing that it is you, you know, if you don't do, if you don't make policy, if you don't push, it won't get done. Of course, there are other things that were really surprising. Like, uh, of course, I, I always knew about uh, Kenya being at the forefront of uh, digital um, money, et cetera, et cetera. But coming back home and realizing that, you know, to this day, I've never uh, done an over-the-counter transaction. You know, everything for me is digital. Um, yeah, okay, there's a, an occasional check that I have to write, but uh, beyond that, um, so I think it was uh, kind of exciting in some ways, but also quite challenging in others. Of course, you don't have much time to worry about your own personal things. You know, it's all the issues in front of you, but uh, it's been quite challenging and I have enjoyed the challenge. Yeah, and you get to see family all the time. Which absolutely, is quite absolutely. Different. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and the weather yeah. is better than, uh, than Washington, I think, than also New Haven. So oh, that's way something. better, <laughs> way better. <laughs> Yes, one of the things I miss most, the weather, sadly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, the digital stuff, it's it's different seeing it from afar and then like being, you know, sort of in person realizing just how salient and broad it is and how much mm -hmm. it's sort of pervasive and a pervasive part of life uh, around around not just Nairobi, but all over. Um, you know, so let's talk about that piece a little. Um, what do you, why do you think it's been so successful and what do you attribute that to? Is it kind of the regulation side? Do you think there's other pieces of the, the success of this that you would love to talk about? Okay. Um, well, you're right, Agnit. Really, Kenya is the cradle of fintech. Um, we could also argue between ourselves and Ethiopians whether Kenya is the cradle of man, but that's that can take us way, <laughs> way into the evening, right? I think but, we'll uh, both say the same thing. It really is. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Two Kenyans uh, talking about this, uh, yeah, would agree instantly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so the cradle of fintech, and this is really where it started, um, and really. Uh, that was back in 20, 2006. Uh, that is when, well, among other things, uh, that's when we had the first iPhone. But I think more importantly, that's when um, the, the product M-Pesa uh, came into being, actually in 2007. That's when we actually brought it into, into, the, yeah, into the live world, as it were. And it has been very, very successful. I think there are many ways of measuring the success of this, but I think the first one I need to point out is how successful it has been in bringing us forward in, in terms of financial inclusion. It was at 26% uh, financial inclusion or 26% of our adults were included um, in, um, uh, in 2007. And now it is actually 83 plus percent. So, it has really helped us leapfrog in terms of financial inclusion. Those are, those are things that I think you and I in a policy environment or class discussion, you think of sort of doubling financial inclusion, you know, to 50%. I mean, that's huge. So going to 85% and it's still increasing um, is something that is obviously remarkable. That's one way of measuring it. But I think uh, your question is, uh, well, there are other ways, but I'll, I'll come to that towards the end. Why was it successful? I think first and foremost, because there was a particular need. So there was a need that it was filling. Basically, it came to us through the transfer payment sort of uh, as a payment platform. So I could send money people. There was a need in the sense that uh, people needed to send their money to their uh, family back home in the rural areas. And uh, instead of uh, giving it to the uh, let's say to the bus conductor or using the postal service and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this actually filled a very urgent and indeed important need. So, and, and that's really what happened. So when it was devised, it was really devised as a transfer 
between P2P, as we call it today, between persons. So the need. Secondly, the regulator looked at it and, uh, and actually was innovative, meaning didn't want to throttle the technology, but actually looked at the concerns like uh, financial stability and other concerns, security, et cetera, and uh, allowed the innovator um, to sort of improve so as to mitigate against those risks and then allowed them in a sort of a test and learn environment um, to launch the product. Obviously, knowing or understanding that if there was a significant problem, it would be pulled off the wall, as it were, in a manner of speaking. I think that was uh, something that was, that was also um, uh, very important in terms of this. So your question about regulation, there were no regulations at the time. So actually, the regulations came later in 2013. That's when we put some regulations in place. But there was clear understanding between the innovator and ourselves um, uh, about sort of the rules of the game and how we move that forward. Obviously, at the end of the day, uh, there was very effective uh, collaboration amongst everyone else, the consumers, et cetera, regulators. I mean, uh, among everyone else who came into this ecosystem. And today now, it is a very elaborate ecosystem. Um, that is not just on the payment side, but uh, has grown into a well, uh, a mature sort of environment. Yeah, great, thanks. So let's talk about that mature environment. You're just teeing up all my questions, Governor, I love it. So one of the big pieces that has grown from it is kind of these apps or wallets that allow you to, to borrow, right? So the most successful example in Kenya is a digital bank account that the Commercial Bank of Africa has built over the rails of mobile money. Uh, it's called Mshwari, just, just for the audience, not for you, Governor, of course. Um, you know, and so, you know, that's one of the most successful digital lending products and digital bank accounts. What do you see the future of those sorts of things? Uh, are there benefits to them? Are there risks? Are you regulating them? How do you think of those sorts of uh, products over the rails of, of mobile money? Okay, um, precisely, we do have the rails now. And now what we need to do is to put on the wagons as it were. And I think one of them is the one that you mentioned, or one set of products are the ones you mentioned, sort of lending. And uh, this is sort of uh, micro lending. That's what I guess we used to call it before. Um, and now on your mobile, you can call it all sorts of other things um, on your mobile device. Um, I think there's a, there's a great future for them. Um, and it isn't just that one wagon. There are many other wagons that need to be put in place. As a matter of fact, with the rails now, what we need to do is to work to make sure that the, the environment continues to, or the ecosystem continues to mature. Of course, there are some risks. And I think these are the concerns that uh, we as a regulator need to be, watch out for. It's not our job to innovate in the sense of saying, this is the direction, uh, let's say picking winners in the old fashioned way, right? Uh, we do understand that was actually a bane of, uh, let's say industrial policy in the past, yeah? Um, industrial policy 1.2. 1, so not picking winners, but actually, setting the rules so that uh, the innovators can expand as needed, et cetera. But I think the concerns often are, from our perspective, financial stability. And this could be if it is in a lending environment from over borrowing uh, or over lending, or for that matter, you know, the issues of consumer protection, so costs, et cetera. Um, and these are things that we need to, or the way the consumers are being dealt with, so that is something that we as a regulator need to be not just conscious of, but uh, to monitor and improve. One of the concerns we have actually is uh, some so-called, uh, uh, well, we call them digital, well, credit only lenders that are not regulated by the central bank or for that matter by anyone else. And unfortunately they've grown like mushrooms and uh, also like mushrooms, you need to be careful which mushrooms you eat, others you may eat some poisonous stuff. And this actually have been uh, a big concern for the consumers. As a matter of fact, in terms of their size, 
they are less than 1% of uh, credit um, in the system. Actually, they are less than the smallest bank that we have here in Kenya. And, but in terms of the noise uh, from the consumers, I mean, it's huge. So we are putting in place now some regulations and actually some, uh, there is some regulations, a bill, a bill that is in parliament today that will uh, put order in this area. But I think the point to make is that uh, it is important to be clear uh, from uh, our perspective, CBKs or the central banks philosophy with regard to regulation, which is you want to maximize the opportunities uh, from innovation while minimizing the risks, you know. And the benefits, as you say, um, are huge. I mean, I, I am, uh, you see, I'm, I was, uh, one of the first papers I read about the impact of M-Pesa was years, Tavnit, you remember that? Well, you measured the, the impact of uh, M-Pesa as what, 2%? Of yeah, 2% GDP 20, 2 of 20 reduction in poverty, yes. I never told you that, uh, uh, what actually went through my mind at the time. You see, years ago, I wrote, I was trying to do a term paper at Yale, of course, um, and uh, T.N. Srinivasan was the one, it was his class. And I don't remember what it was about, but uh, basically uh, I was, I guess I was trying, to, we were discussing um, uh, the impact of trade, uh, yeah, the trade reforms that were there at the time, and TN was an expert on that, and uh, how actually in uh, general equilibrium models, if you try to measure the impact of a trade reform, um, liberalizing trade, and it's all the models always give you a very small estimate, somewhere like one percent to two percent. But we all know that the uh, the advantage of uh, of uh, trade reforms is much more than 2%. And TN told me, sort of in passing, as part of my, my, uh, my paper, I mean, he made the point that actually the benefits come from uh, new products. And I remember going away trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna model these new products? You know, I don't know, show uh, creation, destruction, or whatever else it is. But anyway, the point I'm making is your 2%, uh, as you mentioned, is actually a major underestimate because you have all these other things that have mushroom, mushroom, meaning the wagons, and those have actually huge benefit as we have actually seen. Yeah, absolutely, Governor. I completely agree. That's like the pure rails on the rails with nothing on the rails except that. Um, yeah, I will say, you know, you mentioned Tien. I took Tien's class only a few years after you, Governor, but I did. It was like a trade development class. He was still the same person. <laughs> yeah, I remember him fondly. Um, so I can imagine him saying just what you're saying. Yeah, I think trying to aggregate up all the bits and pieces will take us a while as researchers. But I think it also means there's a lot of interesting open questions to understand what each of these products does and how they how you can design them better, how you can build them better. Um, you know, I personally have been a little underwhelmed by the innovation because I feel like there should be more products, right? So I'm hoping there's a lot more coming. And I, I like your view of regulation being, we don't want to restrict innovation. We just want to manage the risks that come from it, in, risk to the financial system that come from it. But, but, yeah, but uh, Tavnit, if you, if you just let me say one thing that just struck sure. me now and saying that, you see, um, I spend a lot of time listening to innovators. I mean, they come here and do the dog and pony show and tell us, uh, they show us what they are doing, their widgets and things like that. And you know, there are certain things that strike me. First is a lot of them that are in Africa are still stuck in the payments area. Payments, payments, payments. Now they all say that they want to reduce the cost of payments, but I think uh, they need to expand the, and begin to look at other problems. Um, elsewhere, and uh, elsewhere in the financial space, as it were. And, uh, and I think that is what I would strongly encourage uh, the innovators, if there are any innovators on, the, you know, on this webinar. Um, the, in the US, actually, it's not so much in the payments space. It's more in the capital markets area, you know, wealth management, et cetera. That's where there's a lot more action by fintech, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the, my point here is, 
let the innovators look at the at the problems and figure out how to fix the problem. Let, let them not come with a sort of a, a prefixed or you know preordained idea that everything is payments because that's not true. I think we need more wagons elsewhere. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. Sadly, I'm not going to disagree with you, Governor. No controversy here. It will get to a point where we are going to disagree, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but I agree. It's it's... Time we agree on everything. So I just gave a spiel on a call this morning, Governor, where I sort of gave this example. There's not enough wagons. And wagons that work for 70% of people, not 5% of people in the country, right? I think a lot of people get absorbed in the Nairobi lifestyle kind of yes. that's their view of the country. And to be honest, until I did field work in Kenya, I didn't really appreciate kind of the, the breadth that is our, our country. So I think that's a piece where people's use cases often are for a small group of people. And then the wagon doesn't really take off, right? It, it just doesn't mm -hmm. do all that mm -hmm. much. So I would also encourage people to think about not just wagons, but wagons that work for large truck, large portions of our population, not just a few. Awesome. So, you know, we've talked a bit about this stuff. Um, what do you see as the future of fintech? So when we think about innovation, where do you see those, the scope for those products? What, what do you think that fintech itself can really bring to the continent, bring to our country? Okay. Um, my view is that uh, the future of fintech in Africa is bright. I mean, let's begin there um, for many reasons. First, we, uh, there are many needs, right? There are many, uh, you can look around and you'll see many problems that need to be resolved. Uh, in the financial space, we are talking, of course. And, uh, and I would call this sort of more generally the democratization of, of uh, financial services. You and I um, can uh, have a lot of, let's say, financial services that are available to us. Um, you can go to, you know, even wealth managers or whatever, or savings options. Not everybody in Africa has that. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of, um, if we want to move ahead in terms of investment, savings is a key driver, but we need to get the savings from everyone else. Um, so I think there is a lot of need here. Secondly, you don't have legacy uh, structures. Um, so you can actually leapfrog um, from uh, where we are with uh, very little in terms of structures to something that is, let's say, um, designed uh, with 21st technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thirdly, remember 60% of our population in sub-Saharan Africa um, are youth, right? Um, and that is about a third of our workforce is below the age of 25. So you have a lot of, let's say, the pyramid is uh, truly a pyramid. And a lot of that, a lot of the youth are educated, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it is, it's not being a PhD sort of person that you need to, that's not the education here. As a matter of fact, as we have discovered, the Kenyan population are very quick, are very technologically savvy. Um, I have stories about this, and I'm sure we can tell stories if we have more time about, you know, meeting people who are actually doing, uh, let's say, things that you and I would kind of uh, not quite uh, get there quickly, right? Um, they, they have it in their fingertips in terms of using technology, adopting technology. You know, our grandmothers kind of are very accustomed to technologies that uh, maybe people in the U.S. are not. Um, I mean, we are still having trouble with our remote, you know, TV remote, et cetera, right? Uh, well, actually, people here are very advanced in terms of dealing with those things. But also, as I say, um, I think people should begin to look at, uh, I mean, some of the things just as examples. I know a lot of us are, are stuck with the technology. So the questions I get are blockchain, you know, DLT, you know, things like that. I think that's looking at things the wrong way. Look at the problem. What problem are we trying to resolve? And then ask the question, what solution do you need? So it's a bit like writing a thumb paper. You know, you don't write the thumb paper by first solving the equations or whatever else it is. What is the problem that you are dealing with? What is the, uh, what is the economic problem or the research problem that you're dealing with? So it is more that. Um, 
having said that, uh, I, I really think um, that applying the, let's say, all the uh, ideas that are out there, um, Africa will really leapfrog, not just on fintech, but in other areas as well. And I think here is where I'm much more excited because, um, I mean, there, there's so much that can change quickly. You know, I talked about uh, the tripling, uh, more than tripling of the financial inclusion numbers in Kenya and actually elsewhere in Africa because of such a uh, sort of transformative uh, technology. I mean, you have other things as well that have changed in that way. I mean, in terms of, for instance, and the example that I remember is Rwanda. Rwanda, in terms of ease of doing business in that much maligned, uh, let's say, uh, let's just Yeah, maybe it. we shouldn't talk about ease of doing business anymore. <laughs> should. Uh, I mean, yeah. let's, let's get embarrassed as, uh, as economists as well. But I think the point is, uh, in 2007, they were at uh, number 130-something, 135 or thereabouts. And uh, by 2017, they were at uh, number four or five yeah. in terms of uh, doing business. And, and, you know, other things. I mean, uh, an example that I also in my head um, is, uh, you know, in 20, 2007, Nigeria was the second largest importer of cement in the world. Number one, of course, is the U.S., but then in uh, 10 years later, um, a little more than 10 years later, actually, they, had, they were sufficient, self-sufficient in cement and were actually pushing to export because there has been such a change in that industry. So I'm just making the point that uh, most of the things, if they are done correctly, can be transformative. Of course, uh, as development experts or develop, people interested in development as economists, we ask ourselves, um, is it actually changing the lives of people? And I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I think the what problem you're trying to solve is a big one, uh, uh, especially when people talk about blockchain. As you said, I always push like, what is it solving that a regular, pretty decent database won't solve for me, right? Tell me there's value. But I think people often don't quite get that view of the world, which is try and figure out the problem you're trying to solve for at least, you know, in my books also, not just one person, many people, right? I want it to be a reasonably broad problem you're trying to solve. Um, yeah, I think FinTech will be interesting to watch over the next couple of decades. I think it will either take off and be great or kind of, we won't have figured out enough innovation to get as much out of it as we could. And I hope it's the former. Um, let me go back a little bit and just uh, talk a bit more about kind of, policy making in Africa or Kenya more specifically, we've known each other for a few years now, Governor, as I think we met right as you got appointed, if I'm if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was the museum, right? I think that's where we met was the National Museum. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, I, I know you've worked extremely hard in Kenya to make our banking system, uh, should I say more efficient? <laughs> Let's say more efficient. <laughs> uh, without being explicit. Um, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on what you think your biggest success has been so far um, and, and also what you found hard about your current position. Wow, and all within uh, two minutes. <laughs> no, no, take your time. We have time. We have, time. We have okay. plenty of time. Okay, well, um, you see, Tavnit, I, I'm not sure I... At this point, you know, one can look back uh, and sort of be comfortable. But anyway, let that be. Um, <laughs> it, but if I were to, okay, fine. If uh, if I'm thinking of the most significant things, I think the first one in my mind, without a doubt, would be COVID-19, the response to COVID-19. Um, this has been a, a very difficult year very difficult for any policymaker anywhere and for any economist anywhere and the numbers have been swinging numbers not so much numbers but the economies have been swinging you know huge numbers right i remember in march last year i was looking at some of my notes actually from a year ago 
because of we are now one year there, right? So, and I was looking at some of the statements that were made by um, the Jay Poyle, the um, the governor at the Fed, US, US Fed, and he was saying that uh, we would have something like you know, well actually thirty percent, right? Thirty percent sort of declines, um, things that nobody ever thought of. You know, you're thinking huge declines is 5%, it was amazing, off the charts. Um, surviving that, uh, but it isn't just surviving, it's actually uh, figuring out policies that would maintain and strengthen the economy, even as the containment measures were put in place, uh, restrictions on travel, close down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think uh, we have been quite successful. Uh, all things considered, and we have had some sort of retrospection um, over the last few weeks. And uh, in terms of, for instance, the, this, the way the banks have responded or responded at the beginning, um, we've been quite, uh, I think we did reasonably well on that. The decline, actually, um, we still haven't seen the first numbers, I mean, the first print numbers, but they estimate something like 1% growth, um, maybe a little less. Uh, but around there, um, actually, I, I'm not sure it is just that, but then anyway, let's wait a few weeks and they'll give us the first numbers. But uh, I think I told you this, Daphne, the first time, I mean, from around February, which is when we began to see this thing coming, the first time I actually slept, had sound sleep throughout the night was sometime in October. All those many months sort of, you know, figuring, in a sense, being very, very, uh, uncomfortable with uh, things, etc. My mind not at ease. So, um, so I think uh, um, that is number one in terms of uh, uh, what I'm proud of and uh, what maybe has been the most important. Um, if we had uh, not done what we did, I think we'd be talking a completely different story. Um, that's one. The second one is uh, maybe what you mentioned, but. The way I'll put it is sort of the strengthening of the banking sector. Uh, and I think there has been a lot there. Um, first and foremost, I would say is the culture that was pervasive in the banking sector, a culture that is probably not consistent with, uh, you know, uh, proper pricing and, uh, you know, ethical practices, etc. cetera. Um, so clean up of the sector, of course, that also meant that we had to take the hard decision of closing some banks. We've closed three and, uh, and put them in receivership. At one, we actually uh, put them in, um, in liquidation and the other two are in receivership. So it has been, it was tough obviously knowing the impact on, uh, on the people. And uh, until COVID-19 came along, these were the toughest decisions that I ever did. Um, or we ever did, and we didn't take those decisions lightly. I remember one in particular, we were up 48 hours straight uh, working on this thing, and that was sort of the final moments. Um, after many weeks and a few months also, you know, sort of trying to deal with those issues. So that is one. Now, of course, it isn't enough just to clean up. You need to put it in place. You need to sort of begin a certain new, a new normal, as it were. And I think that is what we've tried to um, impact on the, all the actors in the sector. And uh, we want the banking sector to work with and for Kenyans. And uh, actually, uh, during this COVID-19 uh, period, uh, it is because of that, because of that sort of newfound uh, way of looking at things that we have been able to, uh, to do what we, we did. Um, so in that sense, the, if, well, just a, a thumbnail sketch on this. Um, it was more important for banks. Banks understood um, that it is more important to protect their balance sheet as opposed to protecting uh, their p and um, so the, their profits. So, and in a sense, that's why they restructured some of the loans with, the, uh, with, their, with their borrowers. Um, so as to maintain the borrowers, of course, were uh, were selected in the sense that they were already. I mean, they were they they, they had 
performing loans. So you're not restructuring, you're not evergreening, you're doing the right thing, which is only uh, performing loans, restructuring them to support them, et cetera. So that is important. And of course, uh, customer centricity, uh, good, correct pricing, as, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's number two. Number three, briefly, is strengthening the, this is something that most people have not seen uh, because it's really fixing the back room, you know, things in the back end. Um, and this is sort of strengthening the financial infrastructure. Uh, so the infrastructure itself, um, for instance, hardening it to be, you know, again, a cyber security, I mean, on cyber issues, you know, hardening it a lot more, um, improving, for instance, the credit information system, um, which we have done significant uh, refresh in that space, but also other things. We've improved our RTGS, which is our real-time gross settlement systems, um, and uh, frankly, this now is at any is at world standard, um, and we can now move towards a 24/7 economy because we have the capacity to do that. Um, I mean, to to run that in terms of numbers, in terms of all the options that you have. But importantly, data. I mean, if we are in the 21st century, we have to talk data, and so we are doing a lot of work to make sure that we are, we are putting data together in a particular way so that we can make uh, data-based uh, you know, decisions rather than sort of random, random decisions. In a, so there's a, a also having a better central depository system, central security depository system. You know, with all these things, we will really be in the 21st century. And at that point, We'll be just saying we are the um, we are an important uh, financial system. It will be well. We are there. You know, it is Nairobi because everything else is in place. Anyway, those are the three things I could probably say. Great, thanks, Gavin. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to switch to Q and A in a second. Um, but yeah, I think you know it feels like with all of these improvements, now the innovators are just have no excuse anymore. Come play. I think that's Absolutely. what we should say to innovators is just come play. And Nairobi and, is the greatest city in the world. No exceptions. I, I think, yeah, we are not going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> we agree entirely. Yes. Uh, I argue with lots of people of, over Nairobi being the best city, though, I will say. All right. I'm going to start some questions, if you don't mind, from the audience, Governor. I hope that's OK. Um, oh. I'll start with a question from Irene Wagaki. Irene, thanks for being here. She asks, FinTech credit at the moment is mostly for consumption smoothing. Most SMEs have to go to banks for sizable funding. You know, I'm sure he's not lending to SMEs. Um, and there's still a lot of consumer protection issues there. How Do you have a, a vision for how FinTechs can solve SME financing issues? Well, excellent, 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 Irene. Um, I, I think it is, this is something we've been working on for some time. I think we need to dial back maybe two years. Uh, it was 2019, when uh, January of 2019, when we went out there and began looking at uh, fintechs, uh, not fintechs, I'm sorry, SMEs. And I toured the various places, the various markets. Um, actually, I loved that. I, ha I had never, uh, since my return, I hadn't had that sort of freedom to walk um, in the thick of things, you know. Anyway, um, but one of the things that came out of that actually is a product um, that is called Stawi. And basically this is an anytime, anywhere financing for SMEs. Um, and it really, uh, the whole point here is that uh, as an SME, my information in terms of transactions, et cetera, that I do, selling, you know, buying, selling, is on my phone, on my, say, my, my mobile platform, right? So that, if that information is gathered and assessed correctly, you can actually provide a pretty good sense of uh, credit score there. As a matter of fact, I don't remember the numbers now, but uh, it is better than having a credit officer in terms of uh, uh, judging the credit worthiness of somebody using that in, information. So 
this is something that I think we are, uh, well, unfortunately COVID-19 came. And so that was tossed out, the, you know, was put on, let's say on the shelf, you know, yeah. on ski, on, on ice or whatever else it is, yeah. But I think now that the economy is uh, beginning to uh, come or is coming back, this will be a central point. Now, I should hasten to say that uh, SMEs, they need credit, but they need credit plus. And that plus element, other elements, you know, like uh, maybe being given uh, some sort of, uh, um, well, being trained to do the accounts better, um, or for that matter, uh, improving their skills. I mean, one of the ones that we were thinking of, and I saw this, is uh, some of the welders, you know, and they need to be taught how to do better welding, um, sort of uh, joints and things like that. And, uh, and basically they can do that in three hours. Um, so the bank works with them and they bring some sort of uh, uh, truck on site um, that uh, actually they are taught how to do weld, you know, for three hours in the day there. You know, and, and I think it is those sort of things, innovative ways of, uh, let's say, upscaling people's skills, providing them with credit. You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the person I remember when I went on this, uh, um, well, whatever it is, excursion, um, was a painter and, uh, and he, you know, car painter. So he would sell paint um, to the, people that are painting, they repair your car and then they have to repaint it, right? So his job was to sell or his, it was all about paint. Um, and we asked him, so what will it take for you to move to the next level? And he said, well, actually, all it will take me is something like uh, uh, $1,000 worth um, of equipment, which would make him sort of, uh, or allow him to sort of mix the paints and therefore have all sorts of colors, you know, um, not just have the, I don't know, the 10 different colors or however many colors you need, you know, in that sort of environment. So I'm just making the point that the SME story is a big one uh, and we need to work on it in all directions. We just started recently a credit guarantee scheme, uh, but credit is not everything, it is credit plus. Great, thanks, Governor. I've got another question from Ali Opal, um, who starts off saying Kenya's work on fintech is truly impressive. Thanks, Ali. Uh, the governor will take full credit for it, don't worry. <laughs> he asks, being the cradle of fintech, he's curious about what lessons you might have for central bank policy of having a mature fintech environment. You, you touch on the financial stability angle. Are there any specific lessons for the transmission of monetary policy that you think about? Yeah. Well, difficult question. <laughs> uh, I mean, generally, I think uh, depending on the wagons that you put there, uh, you'll have different, uh, let's say, risks on transmission on monetary policy. Um, obviously, if it is lending, uh, then this has a significant impact and we've had to do some work. As a matter of fact, for you to know, we are improving our monetary policy framework um, precisely because of reasons such as this. Because now money, mobile money is very important. Um, it is no longer just something that is uh, in the corner somewhere, lending, etc. And therefore you need to incorporate that when you are thinking or designing uh, policy. Um, so there is that. But I think that is only one angle. The other elements, depending on the wagons, as I said, if you are in, into savings, by the way, remind me, Tavni, to tell them about our savings product. But uh, yes. if you have a savings product, then obviously the transmission will be somewhat different. Um, but it will still be there. My point is you need to think through it um, step by step. And sort of there's no shortcut. Um, you have to do the sort of the brute force sort of step by step uh, checking of how this uh, I, this uh, monetary policy is being transmitted through all the channels and indeed through all the products that are there. But in terms of central bank policy more generally, uh, I don't think the biggest issue for me for these products is on uh, monet the risk. I don't think it is on monetary policy. I think the biggest risk is more on financial stability. 
And that is an important element. And, uh, and I think here is where you need to be more on top in terms of uh, monitoring. Um, monitoring, getting data is so very important. This is one of the reasons why we, we are much further ahead on data. Um, and we want to make sure that we have sort of a, you know, a data lake that you can slice and dice any whichever way, you know. Um, and, uh, and I think in that sense, then you can see the problem before it comes over the, you know, over the, the horizon as it were, yeah. You can already begin to see the elements of that. So that is there. And then the other thing, uh, the last point on this is um, the law needs to change. I mean, a lot of us think that uh, you have a law and it is static. Actually, in this area, because it's very dynamic, the law needs to be much more malleable. Um, and, uh, and so how you craft it, um, the way you write the law, well, that is, that's one issue. But I think also appreciating that uh, uh, you do need to go to the law and amend it and uh, tweak it in whichever way. And maybe it is in the law directly. It's also other things like the prudential guidelines. Um, when they come out, you need to, I mean, writing this quickly and changing them as needed. So those are the directions I would probably put out for, I mean, to think in terms of uh, central bank policy. Yeah, it's related to one of the questions in the chat. I'm not going to ask the question directly, but it's about kind of how do you think about big data that's also coming from the telcos? And is there a piece of that that gets regulated by you guys for use in credit scoring, et cetera, like you said? And how do you think of that data piece? I know we have a data bill um, that imposes significant restrictions on the use of data, but you know we're going to a world where you know a lot about people from their phones. And as people use smartphones, you learn even more, right? The digital lending apps can see Facebook, can see your call records, can see your text message content. You know, so we're getting to the point where some people have access to a lot of data. Is, you know, do you think of how you regulate that or is that up to a, the communications commission? And how do you see that regulation process? Because it fits into the credit banking system somewhat. Yeah, good question. I think we are, we are definitely involved in it. Uh, let's start there. But I think it isn't so much who is involved in it. Uh, that is important. I think it is the attitude that uh, with which or the prism that you view the data that is available, wherever it is. I think first and foremost, the data belongs to the consumer. It does not belong to the telco. It does not belong to the, um, let's say, the, the bank that is working with the, uh, with the individual telco or whatever else it is. And therefore, to use, that, to use that data, you do need to, uh, to provide them with, um, I mean, you, you need to do it with a complete understanding of the, of the consumer. And here is where I think I, and sorry to, uh, to put it this way, but I think we'll all understand it. You know, your, your iPhone or whatever, it updates uh, to a new operating system, right? 13 points, whatever. I don't know now it's 13 or whatever it is. I don't actually know either. <laughs> the way it is. See, this, is a, this is exactly my point. So for me, at least that uh, it updates, I leave it in the, you know, in the evening, that's when it will update. And then in the morning, it will ask me, uh, do you want to uh, push this to agree? on the conditions and uh, yes or no. I mean, you know so well, and they know that, I cannot say no, I just push yes and move on. It's not informed. So this informed consent is very important. Um, and it has to be brought down to the level of the consumer. And also the consumer needs to be given many opportunities to, in a sense, withdraw uh, from all this sort of engagement, and all the data is removed, and, and it has to be, it's hard work. Sure, it's hard work, but it is important to be, uh, to do all there is to protect the consumer. I think what has happened now, and this is the problem of some of the digital lenders uh, that we are dealing with, is they, um, when you join, they will ask you, well, you know, can we would like to use your, your contacts, right? Your list of contacts. And then you say yes, and you move on, right? Yeah. 
then what happens? Uh, they haven't told you how they're going to use it. Um, but what happens is when you don't uh, repay, they will call people on your contacts list. I mean, just think of that. You know, your, uh, your family, your boss, um, and uh, your, your priest back in the rural area. And the, the, everybody's been told, listen, you know, so-and-so hasn't, and this is your, your brother, you, you know, he hasn't paid up, you know, you need to do something. So I'm just making the point that that is not informed consent. Yeah. So um, I use that example a lot saying also, I think Governor, the difference is if Apple had something really bad in the terms and conditions, someone would have found it and there would have been a, a process around uproar to solve it, right? That's less so in this case, I think. The yeah, institutions but, uh, don't function quite the same way. Right. Uh, but Avnit, here yeah, I disagree with you. I don't think <laughs> Apple. Yay! Something you disagree with me on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I there was this. Uh, anyway, I, I it's on my phone. Someone would have read it to you. But uh, when they introduced uh, something, when was it? Back in 2019. And in a sense, uh, it was. Anyway, it wasn't informed consent. Let's just yeah. be honest. Yeah. yeah, I think this is going to be a big issue: is how we think about who's who owns data and how you give consent to use that data and for what. Yeah. And as we but, do digital identification as well with the Huduma number and things like that and start to connect it to things, I think this is going to become really important uh, from both a consumer, like you said, a consumer information perspective, but also a regulatory perspective. And I think that's the, to be honest, this is where I'm, I have, um, well, We've been a bit concerned about the large telcos, um, if I may just uh, have a segue into that, because in a sense, there is a bit of a monopolistic uh, behavior as they try and sort of grab uh, data. There's a lot of data in the payment space, a lot of data in the payment space about people, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you get a large telco getting into the payment space, and not just a large telco, I'm just talking of, you know, the big tech, you know, generally. Um, we need to be careful. I mean, and this is one of the things that in my mind, uh, when you think of uh, some of the large um, big techs uh, around the world, you know, sort of making inroads into Africa, I think the first question is, what are they going to do with the data? And I think in some sense, they also know that uh, there's a fast mover advantage. So once they grab some of this data, um, it will be very difficult to, you know, to get it out of their hands. You know? And uh, so I think we need to be careful about data. We have a responsibility as regulators um, to make sure that uh, the people that uh, we are responsible for um, do not fall um, in those sort of uh, problems um, in our jurisdictions. Great. I think we're close to running out of time. So um, I think we should wrap up. There's a couple minutes, just two minutes left, Governor. So let me uh, take the opportunity to thank everybody who's attended and thank you for being here. Sorry we didn't get to all the Q&A, um, but uh, I really want to thank you, Governor, for being with us today and kicking off our celebrations of the Growth Center and the ID program. Uh, and making time. I know it's evening in Nairobi and just having a conversation with us, which is way more fun than than, than speaking, I think. And so for, at least for me, it is. Um, I hope it was for you too, but we'd really, we're really grateful for your time and, and for you being here today. Uh, I don't know, Tony, if you want to add anything. Thank you, Tavni. Uh, 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 that was great. Really interesting. The uh, Q&A format was uh, quite useful. And I, I learned a bunch of things I didn't know about how money and finance is working in Kenya. I knew a few things, but it's, it's quite interesting. You're kind of on the forefront there. I think we can learn a lot from that, from what's going on there. So, um, you know, I think it was a great event. Um, very much in, enjoyed uh, you both participating. And, and I'll just close with saying, you know, this just shows um, the extent to which I think Yale is a center for development economics. So this kind of conversation happening here is, a, is an illustration of that. and. Um, and let me congratulate again the ID program on 65 years of existence. It's one of the premier programs of its kind in the world. So this, this event was great in showcasing all, those, um, all that success of that program. 
So thank Great, you for thanks, participating. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Governor, Tony. I'm gonna hopefully see you in Nairobi soon. Can't we wait. hope so. Yes. We hope so. Uh, looking forward to seeing you. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Okay. All the best. Goodbye to the participants. Thank you. Thank you.